good news about that choice, the, the path of choosing revolutionary changes, is that all of the pieces are in place to do that. We have actually the technology, right? It's not like we haven't invented um, commercial scale wind power or light and cheap solar panels or electric vehicles. It's not like we don't have an electrical grid in most parts of the world that you can plug electric vehicles into and replace the dirty coal-fired power plants that are producing electricity at the other end with wind farms and solar farms, etc. So we've got that aspect of the technology. We also have actually the money that we need. The, uh, the, the American economy in particular is, uh, the global economy is, is really suffering from a crisis of over accumulation. The Federal Reserve says that the that corporate America is sitting on more uninvested cash than at any time since these records were kept by the Federal Reserve. It's now up to several trillion dollars. This is not money that is paid out to shareholders or given to managers as bonuses. This is the money that is retained by firms for investment, usually in very low yielding, safe government equities. And that the corporate sector is sort of waiting for what the next big thing is, where to invest this. And if there were proper cues from the government in the form of policy that directed that investment towards building out a clean energy sector, a lot of that money would flow in that direction. So there's, there's a lot of money being retained by the private sector for investment. There is also, of course, the question of the military budget, which is over bloated, which we could, we could tap into that. There's the question of getting corporations to pay their taxes. Bernie Sanders um, requested a, a report from the GAO on tax evasion, corporate tax evasion. It, it, was, it found, among other things, that 20% of profitable corporations in America don't pay taxes. A lot of other corporations hide their profitability. A lot of corporations aren't profitable, but a lot of corporations that are profitable hide their, their profitability, but even 20% of firms that show profits don't actually pay taxes because they're sufficient loopholes. So that could be changed. Um, there is also the, 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 the spending habits of the government itself. The public sector, the government is about one third of the US economy. It's, it's similar in other countries, frequently a, a much larger sector of the economy. The federal government has a fleet of about 450,000 mostly large, very inefficient office buildings. It is going to pay for electricity for those buildings. Well, why not make sure that that electricity is sourced from clean energy sources? There are other rules about the percentage of contracts that have to go to disabled veterans, the percentage of supplies used by the government that have to be sourced from American firms rather than purchased from abroad. So there are all sorts of rules in the name of fairness and in national security that shape government purchasing. So it's totally feasible that the government could direct its consumption of energy and buildings and vehicles in a direction that would help jumpstart a real energy revolution. Um, the federal government, for example, has several hundred thousand vehicles. The post office alone has about 140,000 vehicles. They all park in the same place every night. They travel about 18 miles a day. There's no reason that whole fleet couldn't be electrified. If that, if government consumption, and the post office is going to buy new vehicles as the old vehicles break down. If the post office made it a commitment to electrify its fleet, that would help lower the cost of electric vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. So there's all sorts of sources of money. The public sector, there's the question of taxation, and there's the question of just channeling the private sector's investment dollars into something new. Finally, we also have the laws that we need, actually. We don't actually need to pass new comprehensive climate legislation. The, the, the laws we need are the Clean Air Act. And what happened, the backstory to this is that the Kyoto Protocol, the first tr international treaty that was designed to limit greenhouse gas emissions, was signed in 1997 by the Clinton administration, but it was never brought to the Senate for a vote because they said they were, they were never going to ratify it. So it never became U.S. law. In response to that, Massachusetts, the state of Massachusetts, and several other uh, big green groups and one or two other states sued the Environmental Protection Agency. And they said, you have to, the EPA has to regulate greenhouse gas emissions 
under the Clean Air Act of 1970, because the language of that act is very clear, that tailpipe emissions that cause harm to human beings and can be shown through science to cause harm to people have to be regulated by the EPA. This took 10 years, and in 2007, the Supreme Court, the Roberts Court, it was early in the Roberts Court era, very conservative court, agreed and said, yes, the, the EPA must, Massachusetts is correct, and the Massachusetts claim was sea levels are going to rise, that's going to harm human beings in Massachusetts, therefore the federal government has to protect these people by regulating these gases. And the Supreme Court said, yes, the, the EPA not has the freedom to or can if it wants to, but has the obligation to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. And we've been waiting since then for the federal government to actually issue the tailoring rules and, and take the various steps to actually turn that ruling into policy. So in other words, all the pieces we need to actually get off of fossil fuels are in place. And if we were serious about choosing to address this problem, taking the, the path of, of rather radical change by choice, it would be through these means, I think. It would be using the already existing laws, being realistic about the political conditions under which we, we live, using the already existing technology, and in many ways trying to channel the already accumulated and um, uh, not properly utilized capital into this project of building out the clean energy sector. So that is a pretty reformist and not very revolutionary agenda that uh, I described to you. But at another level, it's, that would be pretty revolutionary to euthanize the fossil fuel industry and replace it with an entirely different renewable energy base uh, is, would be, I think, profoundly transformative and worthy of being called, if not a revolution, a revolutionary form of change. And I think that sometimes the, the, um, the problem with this idea of revolution is that people think that everything has to change for there to be revolutionary change. And, and even when you over, even when there is an overthrow of a government, there's still a process afterwards of trying to rebuild the society in whatever fashion uh, the revolutionaries would want. So revolutionary, re revolution is really always much more of a process than an event and a break and a sudden transformation, even when the process involves ruptures and uh, breaks with past political systems, there's still this slower, less romantic problem of how do you build the new society, how do you build the new kinds of social relations, the new technologies that are desired. And so we have the means to deal with the problem, and we have the means to choose a kind of peaceful revolutionary path, and if we don't choose that, the science is pretty clear that sea level rises, extreme weather in the form of droughts and flooding are going to push more and more social systems over the edge into violent disintegration. So, those are my comments. Um, I'll take your questions. I mean, if, you, and if you're, you're wondering where these ideas come from, I'm not, I'm not actually an environmental scientist. I'm, I'm a, a social scientist, but I, my, my most recent book was about climate change as a driver of violence in the global south and, and to some extent in the global north in terms of uh, military and police responses for the rich countries. But, so those are my thoughts on climate change and revolution. Yes? How do we as individuals start a revolution? I think that it has to in, involve uh, transformation uh, in the political process and policy. I mean, there's limits to what we can do in changing our consumption habits that they really there has to be pressure on the government to uh, move forward with either new laws, but I don't see how we could achieve that in this climate, but to, to use the Clean Air Act as it is supposed to be used and to be very aggressive in basically imposing the fines, which is a kind of de facto carbon tax, on the fossil fuel industry, the legal structure for that is in place. And so citizens have to pressure the political class to make this happen because currently they're feeling much more pressure from the fossil fuel industry which is defending itself against the threat of euthanasia. Any other questions? So is the
Um, that's a good question. I think it's what's, what's that's the that's oh, it, what's, is the primary problem just the power of the fossil fuel industry? And I think it's it's the it's that the power of the fossil fuel industry investing millions of dollars in disinformation and lobbying to defend their interests, and it is also the 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 sort of hegemony of really extreme free market ideology in much of the West. You know, it's been 30 years now of just uh, you know, pounding away at this idea that the market knows best, the market is very often treated as infallible, that government is always the problem, that it just intervenes in the market only to distort it and, and damage things. And so I think the other big problem is the fact that a lot of people have imbibed this kind of free market radicalism and feel great antipathy toward the public sector, toward the state, without ever having really looked into whether or not the state is in fact inefficient and the private sector is always more efficient, at those kinds of myths that, that can be easily dis debunked. So I think that it's both the direct actions of the fossil fuel industry and the kind of background noise of just this neoliberal ideology that has been so prevalent throughout the West for so long. Yes? The traditional business lobby position is that changing things here doesn't really affect much because you have the rest of the world. Can you comment? Yeah, well, um, that's not necessarily true when you're the United States, right? And you're the, the largest economy in the world. And actually, changing things here does directly affect the rest of the world because we create the technologies. And if the United States were to transform its economy, that would have the effect on prices, for one thing, right? Prices for renewable energy, electric vehicles would come down internationally, not just in the domestic market. Also, there, uh, there are efforts in other countries. I mean, we are actually lagging in that regard. So if the US, which is the largest economy still, uh, were to move forward, it would be received with um, you know, similar actions and, and much appreciation in many countries around the world, including China. China is sort of the subtext of your question, or at least the way I think about it. And actually, you know, China uh, has been investing heavily in renewable energy and making great strides that put our efforts uh, to shame, really. And the, the primary reason is not that the Chinese leadership are so concerned about climate change, it's that they face the local problem of air apocalypse. The, the air quality crisis in Chinese cities is so intense that they are facing rebellions. They can't get uh, top managers of, of international firms to live in places like Beijing without paying them essentially combat pay because it's so impossible to breathe. The air quality index goes from one to 100. When it gets to 50, you get warnings you know, that, that uh, people with compromised immune systems you know, should stay inside, stuff like that. Occasionally, it gets up to 100 here in the summer in, in America. In, Numerous Chinese cities like Beijing, Chongqing, there are weeks at a time where it is at close to 500. And so people are furious. And for that kind of, do, in response to that local crisis, there's actually quite a robust build out of renewable energy, which is interestingly very similar to how this country started dealing with global environmental problems. It was due to local environmental problems. The Clean Air Act was driven as much by the problem of local smog in the United States in the late 60s, early 70s, as it was by concerns about the health of the planet as a whole. All right. One last question? Or no. Yes. Changing our, the method in which we consume the planet is important, human effort. There's another side to it, and that is taking the CO2 out of the atmosphere, which it, we can do. We know how to do it. Mm -hmm. Storing it is a problem mm -hmm. because it takes up too much space. Um, there is science is exploring this field mm -hmm. of storing it in a variety of possible ways. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a very. I think there's a great. I think there's a great point. It's something environmentalists very rarely talk about. Um, there is a kind of technophobia frequently among environmentalists, but you're absolutely right. The technology to strip CO2 out of the atmosphere exists. 
Um, it is typically the CO2 is then turned into a gas and stored underground. It, this technology is being used, unfortunately it's mostly being used by the oil industry and the place they put the CO2 is to pressurize oil wells. But at the concerns around this carbon capture and sequestration as it's called have mostly to do with the problem of storing CO2 which is a deadly gas that leaks out and people die. But there is actually a technology available to essentially turn CO2 into baking soda. But the problem is the costs for this stuff are through the roof. But, you know, I mean, so, so too are the costs of the collapse of civilization. And if we were serious about, about saving ourselves, I think that that would be a, a key part of the solution, that this technology would be, the firms that have it would be whatever seize the technology, pay them lots of money, whatever, like this, this technology is now common property and in the name of securing civilization, the government is going to have to build this stuff out and make this happen. Because it, it, if, if we expect this to be done as a fee for service kind of market operation, it's not gonna happen. There's no way you can make money stripping CO2 out of the atmosphere and, and turning it into extremely expensive piles of of essentially bicarbonate. But the technology exists to do that, and if we're serious about uh, not crossing really, really dangerous tipping points in the climate system, it should be addressed, it should be used, and should be you know, a, a key part of the policy. So. The book is called Tropic of Chaos, Climate Change, and the New Geography of Violence. It's pretty amazing. Christian, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.